Welcome to Tech Pub. Today in our free concept series, we talk about unit testing, different ways you can use unit testing to improve your application's reliability, and some ways that you can actually use unit testing to help you design your application. Now, you listen to blogs or hear podcasts, you know that unit testing is a volatile subject. Whether you're a superstar or Lord of the Universe, Lord of the Sith, or maybe you're just a regular old cowboy programmer, someone who's got a job to do, work to get done. Lots of opinions to be sure, but generally it's uh, regarded that uh, you as a developer really need to test your stuff if you're going to be considered a professional. So if you don't know much about it, well, this screencast is for you, so let's get on it. So let's get started talking about the tools. Lots of different ways that you can actually unit test your code, including Visual Studio's built-in stuff. I'm not going to cover that today. I'll cover it in a future screencast. Uh, but to get started with, uh, I should talk about the most favorite one that a lot of people use. been using it for a long time, and that's NUnit. You can head over to nunit.org, and when you download it, it gives you a DLL that you can drop into your test application as well as a test run. Another one I like to use, my personal favorite, is XUnit, created by my friend Brad Wilson and uh, Jim Newkirk, who was one of the core developers on NUnit. And I like this tool because it's fast, it's lean, it doesn't have much uh, in the way of frills, uh, and it's very direct. It's easy to understand, easy to use. Uh, I like XUnit a lot, and you can go grab that from CodePlex. And finally, to round out the unit testing framework, there's NBUnit, created by Andy Stopford. A very robust, well-rounded uh, f uh, testing framework. Uh, one that I've used a lot in the past and currently comes with the Galio Test Runner. And speaking of test runners, we now know how to create the tests. Well, how do we actually run them? Well, that's where the second part comes in in our tools, uh, Test Runner. These are the things that actually run the test to tell you if you've goofed up, have a bug, or you're doing good. Uh, the first favorite uh, the first one is the favorite of mine, which is testdriven.net from Jamie Cansdale. It's free for personal use. You can go to testdriven.net to download it. Uh, if you use it on a team or commercially, you have to get a license for it. I recommend this highly. It integrates right into Visual Studio as an add-in, and it's exceedingly easy to use. And the next one is ReSharper. If you have ReSharper installed, which a lot of people swear by, uh, you can use this to run your tests. I'm going to show you this today. I really like the ReSharper test runner. It's fast, it's visual, it's easy to see. In terms of responsiveness and quick and ease of use, I would say TD.NET definitely gets you there. Uh, but if you want to see all your tests run at once in one nice uh, program, then ReSharper's test runner is great. Now, the one main issue with it is it's not free. And for that, you need something like Galio. Now, when you download MBUnit, you'll probably be headed, uh, head or sent over to the Galio.org website, which is what we're looking at here. And uh, you can download the bundle. MBUnit comes with uh, Galio. Galio is the runner, MBUnit is the framework. And as you can see, it's a very rich visual environment. Uh, some people like that a lot. I know I do. Uh, it might be a little bit overbearing for use all the time uh, to run every single test. Uh, however, if you like visual responses, Galio is probably top of the stack. And not only that, it's free, which is always a very compelling reason to use something. Well, for today, I'm going to be using NUnit downloaded it. I'll be using this as my testing framework. Uh, it's been around for a long time. It's easy to use. And I'll also be using both testdriven.net and the ReSharper test runner to run the tests. Now it's worth mentioning one more time that Visual Studio has all of this stuff built in. Uh, if you want to use Visual Studio's test running apparatus, you certainly can. It's very easy to use. Uh, but for today's demo, I'm just going to use the stuff that's been around for a long time, is free, and is not part of the upper level requirements, meaning you need to have Visual Studio Standard Plus installed. Uh, with these guys, you can just use uh, Express versions. So I'm going to show you how to do it for free. Uh, that's important stuff. So let's get on with it. So what does a unit test look like? How do you actually do this kind of thing? And so to show that, let's get started by doing a basic unit test. Now here, I've installed NUnit, as you can see. It gets put into my program files, and I get a couple things with it. I get these executables, which are test runners. I also get all the DLLs that I'm going to need, and I've referenced that DLL. You can see right here, NUnit.Framework. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the Samurai Shogun application I used for dependency injection and inversion of control screencast. And inside here you can see my samurai. He's got a weapon. Um, I have removed the dependency injection stuff for clarity with unit testing today. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm just going to quickly add a class uh, and that is going to be for my test. Now this is just a regular old console, or excuse me, uh, application or class library. And nothing tricky in here. And when you're working with unit tests, what you're really doing is you're just creating methods inside of a class. 
And to get it to work with uh, an unit, uh, you need to label that class or attribute it as a test fixture. This tells the runner that you're dealing with n unit tests. A lot of people don't understand this. It's just tests are simply classes with methods inside them decorated a certain way. In this case, we mark a test with the test attribute. Then we give it some kind of name. And naming is argued about a lot, and you can see I'm using underscores here. Some people jam it all together. Uh, could be whatever. So, well, to understand this, let's do a test. In this case, I'll do a super silly one. One plus one should equal two. And we set this test up in a, uh, a prescribed way. In the very top, we do what's called arranging. We arrange our variables, just like you would in any other class or method. You uh, declare them and set them. And next up, we do act. An act is where you actually do a thing that you're going to test the result of later. In this case, we're going to add one to the other one. And finally, we do what's called assert. And this is going to be the thing where we actually test the outcome. Now, every class library that comes with a framework has some sort of assert object, something that will test the conditions of two things. In this case, you can see all the tests that you can use. We have ignore and is not a number, null tests, we have true and false. In this case, I want to be sure that I pick a method that is going to accurately reflect the thing I want to know. In this case, I want to make sure two things are equal. This is an important point. I could just say assert is true, uh, but I don't want to do that for this. I want to make sure that I test equality. I don't want to test the truthfulness of something. So I'm going to use testdriven.net and I run it by right clicking and clicking and running and in my output panel, boom, I see the results, which is great. So our first test is passed. That, ladies and gentlemen, is a test. Now, if I wanted to see how it failed, I could also add a message. I could write a failing test, and you can see here in my output panel, that's exactly what happens. Uh, it tells us what was wrong. It also throws out the message that says the numbers didn't add up. Well, if you have ReSharper installed and you want to try something different, you can see I have ReSharper. It just knows that this is a test. I can actually click on that little button there, the little green and yellow guy, and it'll bring up the test runner. It'll grab my test results, and then here's the output, uh, shown right inside of Visual Studio, which is great, and I get a nice message down at the bottom. Well, that was interesting in concept, but let's do something real this time. Let's take our samurai, and we'll uh, we'll get rid of this test, and we'll do something uh, worthwhile. So I'm going to head over and refactor my samurai a bit, and if you notice, I've refactored the attack method to return a string. It's a little bit different than the way it was with our dependency injection example. So I want to just rename this. I want to make uh, sure this name says something. And ideally, you want the name of the method to be what you're asserting. In this case, I just want to test to make sure my samurai can chop someone in half. So in this case, I create a new samurai. I call him Sam for no better reason than I like it. And here, we're just going to attack something. In this case, we're going to attack the same thing, the unwashed masses. And we want to make sure that the result is going to be, well, that he chops them in half. And at this, kind, at this time, the only thing I really have to test is the return message. And so you can see I'm testing the message that's returned. I'm going to run a comparison and make sure it's equal there. And now what I can do is right click and run my test and then we can see it passes. So great, this is a test that I can actually use in the real world. How fun. Well, there's more to do here. I've got uh, another weapon I got to test. So I can just copy and paste that test down. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to rename this method to be something, well, a little bit more appropriate for my other weapon, which is my shuriken, throwing star or small sword. In this case, I'm going to arm my samurai with a new shuriken, and I'm going to attack the unwashed masses again, but this time I'm going to check and make sure the message is a little bit different. That's the message I get with my shuriken, and indeed it passes. All right, we are on a roll here. Our samurai, uh, I know the outcome of both a sword and a shuriken attack that makes my code just a little bit better because, well, I can prove that it is correct and that it works. Uh, but I have one last condition that I have not checked. Uh, I need to check and make sure that if I pass in a sword, it works, which I just did. Uh, also got to make sure if I pass in a shuriken that it works. Now, what I haven't tested is a default. What do I do if I don't pass a single thing in? Well, it should chop people in half by default, and there's my test that proves that. So now I have a verifiable and quantifiable way, as you can see right in front of me, that my samurai does what it should do when I give it the right weapon. 
Unit testing can be a lot of fun and more than just a little addictive. And if you start doing it early on in the development process, you'll find it a lot easier to build out unit tests and uh, keep on going with them as you build out your code. In fact, some people like to write tests before they even do anything else. And one thing I like to do is to write requirements right up in the top of a test class so I know what's going on. In this case, um, my first requirement is that a samurai has one or more weapons. Well, right now I don't really have that ability with my samurai, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a test. I'm going to write actually the test before I put in the abilities of that samurai to carry more than one weapon. So to make things easy, I just copy and paste uh, down below, and I need to have a method that is going to tell me, hey, how many weapons does your samurai carry? And in this case, uh, all I have is attack. I don't really have anything else. I need a method that says, well, get weapons. Something like that. Now I can change this later on in the future. What I'm going to do right here is I'm going to use one of the really cool features of ReSharper. I can come over here and hit Alt Enter, and it senses that the method doesn't exist and says, hey, you want me to create this for you? And sure, I do. I just want to know how many weapons my samurai's got. So in this case, I just simply return, oh boy, I don't have a list. All I have is one weapon. Well, I need a list. I need some sort of innumerable thing that can return count. Once again, I'm going to use ReSharper. It's going to create a local list for me that I can now use to return the count. Well, I'm still needing to do a little refactoring to make this work. You can see that it's, my test is sort of driving my design of my samurai. And that's okay. I have to make sure that the requirements, uh, well, I got to make sure I meet that requirement. So right now what I got to do is some refactoring to use the list instead of the default weapon, which I was doing before. And here you can see I'm just resetting everything. And this is a trick that I'm doing right here where you just want to write enough code to get a test to pass. And this may look, might look silly. I know I'm going to refactor it in the future, yeah, but you know you want to make yourself refactor it. That's a principle called Yagni. I'll talk more about that later on. So I'll build my application. Everything seems to run. Now I should be able to go back to my test here, and I should be able to run the result. I'm going to change the assertion, because clearly I don't want to test a string. I want to test that the value is greater. I want to test that my result is greater than zero. Sure enough, it is, so my test passes. And if I rerun all my tests, you can see I've got green checks all the way down. It's a good habit to get into. If you start writing more tests as you're developing, uh, you should always want to check and make sure that you didn't break something as you build stuff out. One of the benefits of doing uh, testing during development. Well, if I read that requirement one more time, it says one or more weapons in my test here. Just make sure that the weapons that I'm, my samurai is carrying is greater than zero. So uh, that's uh, really not capturing what the title is. What I'm really asserting is he's got one weapon. That's all I'm adding in. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep on adding some tests because I want these tests to be as concise as possible with respect to what they're called. So when I read these in the output window, I want to make sure I understand what it's doing. So in this case, I want to make sure you can carry two weapons. Um, well, you know what? The interesting thing is we pass a weapon in right through the constructor here. I've got no other way to tell my samurai what weapon to carry. So I'm in a bit of a pickle. But again, this is my testing sort of driving the design of my samurai, which is okay. And in this case, I want to create a method called equip where I can pass a weapon in and then I can equip my samurai with that weapon. And you can see simply I'm just going to be adding things to a list and I can refactor my class now to use the equip method rather than a list operation, which makes me feel good. This refactoring is uh, making me happy. So now I can add some code here so that my samurai can have a weapon handed to it, which is what I want to do because I want to have more than one weapon. So in this case, I'm going to tell him to equip a new shuriken. And that should make everything good. And now I just want to make sure my test result comes back that it's greater than one. And that should work, and it certainly does. So that's good. So now he's able to carry two weapons. So my samurai is pretty cool, but as far as MUDs go, well, he's a pretty weak samurai. He can't even change which weapon he uses. In fact, the only weapon he uses is the one that uh, is handed to him when he comes into being. So we definitely need to be able to equip him with different weapons. So let's write a test that's going to facilitate that, and I'm going to show you a feature of test-driven development, otherwise known as TDD, where you write the test first, and uh, you want to watch it fail. It's called red-green refactor. You want to watch it fail, 
and then you go and you correct it by adding the appropriate functionality. So in this case I am testing to make sure that he can pick a weapon. I'm going to equip my shuriken as you can see that I'm doing. And then I'm going to assert after he attacks that well that he pierces the unwashed mass's armor. In this case it's going to fail because as I instantiated the samurai here you can see I gave him a sword. Then I equipped him with a shuriken. Well he didn't know what to do with the shuriken. He couldn't pick it. You couldn't equip it. What, is it. what good is it if I just give him a weapon and he can never use it? So let's add some functionality for that. And you can see I've created a local field here. I weapon called equipped. This just uh, this dictates what weapon he's going to attack with. So I set that weapon. I'm going to just try and get this test passed. Set that weapon during the equip method. And then I attack with it. Just enough to get the test passed. Well, my samurai is getting better. Now he can change weapons, but so far uh, he can carry a lot of weapons. We know that. He's got an unbound list, pretty much. Uh, what we need to do now is to make sure that he doesn't carry more of the same weapon. Well, while it is true that a samurai carries lots of swords, uh, it's doubtful he carries more than one shining blade of fury. Uh, that's probably his favorite katana. So what we want to do is we want to make sure that if we hand him more than one, well, he only carries one. Uh, this needs to be part of our MUD rules. So I'm going to refactor this test here a little bit, and I'm going to watch it fail. As you can see, I'm adding two swords, and I'm just going to want to make sure that I only have one sword equipped. As you can see, it fails. That's exactly what we want to see. It's because as we equip a weapon, it's just added to a list. So I just have to do some simple checking here as the first part. I really just should uh, do a contains. Make sure that the weapon, uh, the weapons list, if it doesn't contain the weapon, well, add it in. A pretty simple test. But as you can see here, that's not exactly going to work because the comparison is comparing hash codes and other internal values. Uh, the objects are actually not equal; they're not the same. Uh, but what we need to do is we need to tell the code and tell the application. Well, these swords are the same, and we have to come up with some criteria for that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just define that. How do I know if one sword is equal to another? Well, in this case, I'm going to create a value called name, just a simple property. And I'll just compare the names. going to keep it simple. Now, I could do other things if I wanted to, but having a name is easy enough. Uh, in this way, we can also add the name uh, property to the output if we like. And using ReSharper here, I'm refactoring and adding a definition uh, to all my other classes. And as you can see in here, I have a property called name, and I'm having it set in the constructor. So whenever I create this weapon, I just have to tell it what name it is. And that way I can set the name property, and I can use it later on in the application. I'll do the same here for my sword. Pass in the name whenever it gets instantiated through the default constructor. And for both classes, I'm overriding equals, making sure I compare the names. Now I'm able to come in here and refactor my test class and send in the name as I need to. Yeah, and my star of might. Woohoo! And so now my test passes because I have equality going where I'm checking the names. So that works out just fine. So as I examine my requirements here, uh, he can, yes, indeed, he have one or more weapons. I got one more. He should be able to use both at once. I don't want this to be some run of the mill mud. He should be able to do both attack with both weapons at once, don't you think? I see that all the time in the movies. Why not have it in, as part of my mud? All right, well, let's do that. Let's copy and paste and create a test to, to see if that's going to be able to work. Well, as typically happens, the very first thing that I run into is I don't have a method of attacking with everything at once. Uh, so I'm going to write myself a little comment here. Got to attack with both weapons. And then I need to add a method. What am I going to call it? Well, let's use the Aikibato. Attack at once. Both weapons. All weapons. And here we go. Attacking the unwashed masses. Well, again, I'm going to use ReSharper to help me define this uh, method that I don't have defined. And it is going to return a simple string. And I'm going to pass in the target, just like I have before. And then using a string builder and some simple list operations over my weapons, I can now return a message back. And so that message... Unfortunately, I got to do string comparisons, but hey, what the heck? Uh, that whoops, and you know what? I forgot to do. I forgot to uh, set the return here, so I got to do that real fast. I'll set my return variable, 
uh, make sure I capture the result. There we go, and I should be good to go here. Uh, I should be able to chop the unwashed masses clean in half while piercing their armor. That's not easy to do, and as you can see, my test passes. I've got one mean samurai.